Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope you all are well. Thank you for taking the time and your interest in what we're going to talk about here today. Um, I would just say this is a topic that I'm very personally interested in. And it's something that, in all honesty, uh, as I look across my life, I guess this is the thought, as I look across my life, this is a question that has been recurring for me. <laughs> um, just a continuous or recurring struggle to think through some of the things I want to talk about here. I'm going to talk about a couple of different ideas first. But um, where I'm headed as kind of our core discussion here is a question of what defines the, quote, successful life. What makes a life successful? Or how would I know if I am living life well? And just to put a little bit of that, of that in context as I'm I, I'm thinking semi-biologic, uh, uh, biographically. <laughs> um, so I'm, just so you know my context or, or how I'm speaking from, I'm 38. Uh, so I have, I'm married and have four kids. My oldest is nine, my youngest is two. Um, part of the thing that's interesting about this specific topic to me, in terms of talking to young adults or that, that whole category of life, is I there is a benefit of someone speaking who was maybe let's say someone in their um, 60s 70s 80s who was able to look back on decades I don't have that so I'm only 38 and in that sense then I don't have that kind of depth or breadth of life to look back across in the other direction I guess I feel like in some ways, as I've struggled with the questions or trying to figure out the, the answers that I've sought, okay, a sense of what would be a quote successful life or what would define living well, living successfully. Some of those questions are a lot closer to me <laughs> because I'm still working through them. And I suspect that when I'm, when I'm 60, 70, I'm gonna have a different perspective. In fact, I probably will have forgotten some of the struggle, realistically. I don't know how much this transfers, but at least in an American millennial age context, I'm technically a millennial. Most divisions put millennial starting at 1982. That was when I was born. <laughs> so I'm right at the, I'm the oldest, I'm the oldest group of millennials. <laughs> Just barely part of that group. Um, there's a concept among millennials, which is they'll start talking about a quarter life crisis. I would be curious how many of you, maybe if you give me some response in the chat, how many of you have heard of that, the quarter life crisis concept? It's kind of like midlife, you know, you, you know the midlife crisis concept that a person hits their 40s and 50s and they stop and um, they're starting to struggle with what was the meaning of my existence? What was I trying to do? Some of the things, the dreams I had, the hopes I had didn't materialize. And so since it didn't happen, then you know the stereotypical thing is the guy goes out and buys a sports car and gets a, a gold necklace or something, <laughs> starts trying to act like a teenager again. Um, the concept with quarter life crisis, I don't see anything in the chat, so maybe that means none of us, none of us have encountered the idea. But the concept with quarter life crisis is among millennials, um, people have started struggling maybe a little bit earlier with some of these questions, these meaning questions, these purpose questions. So, you know, you finish school, you graduate, you go through all of the things that you had set out for your life. And so, okay, I accomplished this, I did this, I graduated, I get my first job, I buy a car, I buy a flat. And then the concept goes, and this is it. <laughs> this is what I was working for all that time. In this some kind of weird way, when you have something you're pushing, pushing, pushing for, must achieve, must get there, then you kind of stay on the treadmill and you're pursuing. And then this somewhat weird way, once you achieve those things, might you kind of stop and go, whoa. And so now then, I'm just going to work for the next 
40 years and make money and that's it there's nothing else that's the quarter my quarter life crisis problem or the quarter life crisis question and it's a hard one it's a it's a hard one it's a really interesting one too so that's where i'm going some of this some of the basic questions i would like to investigate with you is just exactly that um, what is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life? What are we trying to accomplish? And how would we know when we got there? Um, so let me start out then with some of the other like supporting concepts that we'll set up for that. And uh, I think, I don't know if that the notes were dropped in the chat or not. Doesn't matter if they were or they weren't. I'll drop them in the chat later, either way. But if uh, you have those, you can follow along. That's fine with me, or I'll put those up on the screen here. Um, let me just show you a handful of, what do I have, seven concepts that are things I kind of wish, respectfully, I wish somebody would have told me uh, 30 years ago. It would have been helpful just for processing if I had someone who would, would say some of these things to me at that point. So anyway, I'm happy to share those with you now. Uh, and the first one of those concepts is that you're not waiting for life to begin but life already began. You're not waiting for life to begin, but life already began. Okay, this can seem like a really ridiculous truism and not terribly helpful. So let me clarify what I mean by it in the first place. Um, using, building off what I said just a moment ago, we kind of have a cultural script for us with life where the idea goes, you know, you, you, you follow this script, you, study and you know work hard and study hard and get into university and then once you're there then make sure you pick a good career and you follow through finish out your career if you do everything right then you get a good job and if you get a good job then okay now you're a success uh you get married and so being married then you're happy together and you you know have all of the niceties of life or whatever and the i think the the underlying assumption that I'm going to react to that I, I actually, I really don't like at all. <laughs> the underlying assumption in this goes, basically, you're waiting for your life to begin at some point in the future, once I graduate, once I get the degree, once I get the flat, once I'm married, now life begins. Something like that. Maybe we wouldn't ever say it that way, but there is this underlying assumption that that's the beginning of life. And I, I just want to drop in here to say, you're not waiting after graduation, after you get married or some other kind of marker, and then life begins. The clock's already ticking. Every day is already going past. You are living life right now. And you're not waiting for a moment when it will happen. This is it. You have a finite number of days. And you're living them. And they're going by. As a support for that concept here, I'll show you something that I have on my on my home screen. Um, maybe it's a, a little macabre. I don't think so. Um, but I came across this and uh, I'll just show you here. I'll just show you right on my screen. I came across this timer and the timer is, you can put all kinds of different things in there. Like you can put in, you know, how many days have gone by or how long is it until such and such a thing begins, that kind of thing. And so I, I modified it a little bit and got in there and uh, I don't know, monkeyed around a little bit with the, the way it works inside. And I configured it so that I could show something different. Oh, well, while I'm talking about showing you something, let me get it plugged into the right cord. I modified it so that it would show me the breakdown of the day, the month, the year. And then the last thing it shows me is the breakdown of my life. <laughs> and all it is, I just took my birthday and I extrapolated out. I think I took what is the male life expectancy and I just stretched that out. And then I put in the date based on that male life expectancy, you know, what I should expect as a, an American male. Um, how long I should expect. I just extrapolated what my death date would be. So for some reason, I'm having trouble getting it to connect today. Give me a second.
Okay, that'll work. We can do that. All right, I'm just showing you a screenshot. <laughs> um, it's just a screenshot from my iPad. And I have like a little widget for my to-do list and you know, a picture of my wife and stuff like that. And here's these other tasks I need to accomplish. Here's what I'm talking about right here. And uh, I just broke it down. Here's the passage of today and that'll update as the day goes by. And this month, we're about halfway through December. And this year, we're almost done with the year. And then I just put in, that's my life. Um, I was showing this to somebody, he was a teenager and uh, so I think he's 14 <laughs> and he looked at it and he said oh yeah okay so your life is half done <laughs> and I, you know <laughs> it's a little painful uh, it's good <laughs> it's good to recognize your life is going by okay so you could try that you could go home and it wouldn't be hard to create a little graph for yourself you could do like a you could do a pie chart or something how much has passed how much is based on normal life expectancy but we recognize by the time most of us graduate and kind of start into the next part of the script, you're already a thirty good 30% 30 in. Your life has already begun. And I, 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 an encouragement then, if it is an encouragement, maybe it's a discouragement. Don't really think as if my life will eventually begin. Recognize rather that your life has begun it's already here, it's already happening, it's already progressing, and you really don't have time to waste. <laughs> Live well. Um, I'll return to this idea a good bit later on, but there's a podcast I'll talk with you about and I'll, a book that goes together with that that I really enjoyed. Um, and the in this podcast, they're discussing about this book, but the, the one writer or the interviewer just says, I wish somebody had told me back when I was in my 20s and 30s, I wish somebody had told me to take some time and think about what is the good life. Because that would have helped me start living wisely before a lot of my life was already gone. And, and that's kind of what I'm hoping to do here. That's where I'm wanting to start out. All right, I'll move to a next point. Any questions or any feedback you wanna give? I'll pause for a second. I'll pause for a second for two reasons. One is if I don't pause, you might not ask the question. So I want you to ask the question. The other reason is I have a cup of tea here and I wanted to put some milk in my tea. And it's hard to put milk in my tea while I'm talking about topics. So so that's my, that's my, uh, you can decide which is the real reason. No, the real reason is I wanna get your input. Anyone have a, uh, you can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself a question or a comment or feedback or or you want to take a second and put some milk in your tea it's great <laughs> any feedback you want to have so far there we go there magically now my ipad decided to work so maybe that'll help us out there okay i'll keep on going but i have some i'll have some questions for you later so don't worry um, so my first question then, or my first concept then was, you're not waiting for life to begin, life already began. A uh, second concept that I'd like to toss in here, and I'll probably speed these up a little bit because I wanna get to some other things. Worry less about the details of what you do, worry more about who you are. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting choked up about it. <coughs> this was my concept earlier, We're talking about the will of God, but, it is an interesting, I guess, just a dynamic of the 20s, 30s years that you have so many decisions to make. I'm sorry. It's a pain. It's, it's frustrating. And I remember those years and I remember the frustration of trying to, you know, like constantly, well, what am I going to do about, what about the, okay, those questions are huge. And then uncertainties. Um, so yeah anyway uncertainties about how things are going to develop for you and relationally and financially and career and all of those things so it's stressful and if i could encourage you about one thing i do think if you talk to people that are now kind of past that curve just so you know the curve kind of drops off once you hit into like 30s or something and it starts to level off you establish yourself more or less and what you're doing and identity and things like that. You kind of establish that. The curve lessens off, 
and you stop feeling so much the stress of decisions, decisions, what will I do? But I do think we could help ourselves better biblically if we would use biblical categories. Some of the things I talked about earlier, and maybe if you missed that session, that's fine. Or if you wanted to go watch it, that, of course, would be fine with me too. Um, but the session I argued, instead of necessarily using finding God's will, which is you can't even find that language in the Bible. Instead of using finding God's will language, what if we talked about pleasing God language? And my goal in life is then to please God. That, I think, would be transformative for a lot of us. In any case, worry less about the details of whether I major in that or I do this or I do this. And I would say worry more about the you in the sense of what am I becoming? Who am I? What do I love? And I'll just make, I'm going to make one uh, illustration of this or an application or anyway, whatever, example of it would be something like we stress about the marriage decision. Who will I marry? How will I know? It's a huge decision. I, it's, it's just huge. It is absolutely life defining. There's some encouragement for you. It's absolutely life defining and it's very honestly very difficult to figure out. Yeah, just to figure that out. Um, but I would encourage you instead of stressing so much about him or him or her or her, I would say invest in you being the kind of person you ought to be. You becoming the kind of person who loves God and his word first and foremost. It's kind of a seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Instead of us stressing about the details of which career, which person to area or so forth, the question is who am I? If I'm not a person who has as my first and most basic priorities, I, I'll, I'll speak as a guy because I am one. Um, if, if it's not my first and most basic priority that I love God with every fiber of my being and I am going to serve him with a wife or without a wife or with kids or without kids or with a job or without one, I'm going to serve God, period. I'm just going to serve God. You can't stop me. I will serve God. If that's the format for it or the framework for it, I'm going to relationships. I'm going to attract a certain kind of girl. And if truthfully my priorities are of a different sort, I'm going to attract that sort. Some of what's going on when I'll, I'll talk to young men and they'll be like asking about, you know, I'm interested in this girl or something. And what I'm kind of thinking in the back of my head is, you know, I don't know. She's too good for you. <laughs> in the sense that her priorities are deep and rich. And I don't know that you have that kind of depth, man. And uh, I, would, I would encourage you just, instead of thinking so much about who is this person I'm going to marry, think more about how do I become a person that, that a good man or a good lady would want to marry in the first place. You attract who you are. You attract the kind of character and the kind of person that you yourself have lived out. I really do need to move faster. So let's see what we can do. The most important realities are your loves. Um, related to some of these ideas, I think most people set, they kind of mostly set their priorities and their core relationships during all early adulthood. Like, like I said, this kind of 20s to 30s transition. By the end of their 20s and 30s, they pretty much, this is maybe a little bit cynical, they pretty much are who they are. By the end of their 20s or 30s, it's kind of like set. And if I was gonna be completely cynical about it, if I was gonna give into my cynicism, then they set their direction like this, and then the next decades, they just kind of extend that path. It's not always that way, because people can grow, people do grow, and it is possible for change. I wouldn't, for sure, I wouldn't want to be in the ministry if change was not possible. So, I mean, I really want to believe, I must, I have to believe in change. I have to believe it's possible. It does, it is possible, and it does happen, and I see it happen. I would say more often than not, change is the exception, not the rule. People don't change more often than they do. 
and a lot of times they kind of set their priorities and then the rest of their life is it's almost like um, setting the rules for the game or setting out the the um, setting out the prerequisites for an argument or setting out the terms of a math problem you set it out and from there it's just a matter of doing the figures and working it out to its conclusion and for a lot of people life is kind of like that they set what they care about and their character and their core realities early on and then the rest of the life is just kind of like living out the math problem it's pretty uh, I, I, forgive me for the cynicism don't be that guy be a person that grows but in any case if you're going to be setting the precedent for the rest of your life please set it right please set it right please love God and and his kingdom first because a lot of people are living for folly they really are and it's distressing to me all right speaking of folly uh, being cool is fleeting I'm going to I'm going to change my position here a little bit so so I can uh, uh just move what I'm right I have a chair there. All right. Being cool is fleeting. I think my idea here goes uh I mentioned earlier life scripts. Like we have a sort of a okay, this is what you do. And then within the framework of that life script like so the typical life script or whatever you know you go to college and then you graduate and if you're in and you might get a master's and if you're really an excel you know want to excel you might go for a doctorate and then after that then you get married and you try to pay off those debts and then you buy the house and, and uh, if you're doing really well you get a big house and this kind of, we have these life scripts and within the life script then there's a certain range of what is like a, a meritocracy sort of thing and so the 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 assumed script is that in order to live life well you just want to find some way to be on the top edge of that meritoc meritocracy comparison game and so you want to be the guy who went to the most um prestigious college and graduated towards the top of your class with some really challenging sounding degree and then get the big job that makes a lot of money and maybe have the corner office and work your way up and go up the the the, the hierarchy within your work setting. Um, and you want to have a beautiful wife and you want to have a fast car. I don't know. I'm being a little, a little shallow. But here's the life script, and it's just sort of handed to you. And you measure your self worth off of that identity. Uh, I referred to this podcast earlier. I can share it here later if you want. It's a really good podcast, but they just observed and there's this as they're discussing way too many people confuse their identities with their possessions. And so the things I have establish my value as a person. That's disgusting, but it's typical. A lot of people confuse their identities and their stuff. That's painful. And the basic question then we're asking here is what I say being cool is fleeting. Um, really what I'm trying to get after is what on earth does this thing mean? I mean, there's a lot of people that I, it's almost like they're essentially living life around that word. What did that thing mean? What is it? And I, I would encourage you while you can think about that. You, you, before you spend your life pursuing it, at least figure out a definition. Because in any case, being like young and um, physically fit and energetic and uh, smart and learning and grabbing a great job and all of those things, that stuff, it, it goes away real fast. Um, it's going to be fleeting. It's going to evaporate. Okay, being cool is real fleeting. So take the time to figure out what exactly it is that you're pursuing. I'll come back to that a little bit later. I should stop again. I should uh, drink a swallow of my tea and I wanna see if um, anyone has questions or feedback or what do you think? Any, any feedback so far? Okay, 
Well, I took. I think I took three swallows. So I think that's enough swallows. Um, I can keep on going. Glad for your feedback. Glad for questions or responses that you have. Or if something I say strikes you wrong, just comment in there and say, "When you said this, that struck me wrong." <laughs> no, I'm happy to happy to chat about stuff. Uh, I think I have three more here, and then I want to move to the other kind of the other part of what we're going to talk about. Become an interesting person. Read and think a lot. Um, yeah. I believe in this deeply in the sense of what I was just saying a little bit ago. Why do we spend a lot of time on this concept, like this sort of notion of being cool or accumulating a lot of stuff or getting the best job, whatever that means? I, 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 I'm, I, obviously, my first priority is the kingdom of God and kingdom of God and his righteousness. So my first priority would be spiritual realities. But I do think, like, right in there with that, and maybe inseparable from it, to value God's kingdom and eternity and so forth, I think does drive us to have a longer range, let me say, a longer range vision for our values. Meaning the stuff that is currently trendy or the stuff that's cool, like right now, to have a little bit of a view to recognize, hey, um, the world is a couple of, you know, depending on how you understand it, six to 10,000 years old at least. It's a really old world. And during that history, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happened that's just, it happened and it's gone. All right, 1834. Who knows here what happened in 1834? Okay, I have no idea. It was just a year. And then there was 1835. And then there was 1836. And you know, there's not there's not any of those numbers I just said that I can give you, wait for it, even a single piece of information about. But there were people that were born those years, there were people that died those years, and there were a lot of people in between that got old during those years, got older. They just lived, then they died, and now they're gone. And it's not going to be any different for 2020. I, oh, they're going to remember the quarantine. I don't think so. I mean, did you know about the 1918 flu epidemic before this happened? Maybe, but maybe not. All right, no. People are not going to remember 2020. Not really. And on that basis, then, I think it is a little bit of a drive to look past what is trendy or right now interesting and to engage with big ideas. Big ideas that last big ideas that were here before you were born and big ideas that will here be here a long time after you're gone. And of course I am talking about theology, but I'm talking more than that. I'm talking about classic, long-term enduring things. I'm talking about even things that, I mean, I like philosophy, I like art history or just world history, big ideas. Become an interesting person, read and think a lot. I, I could do this like, for biblical theological reasons but anyway i mean just yeah listen to people that have accomplished that are accomplished and that have uh, that have done well believer or not and they're going to say things to you like turn the tv off and minimize your use of social media which i do i'm regular on twitter and facebook but anyway minimize that and go to things that are going to be here for a long time Okay, a good sh thing to shoot for would be to read maybe, maybe start with at least 20 books a year. Work your way up maybe to 50 or so a year. It's not too hard to do. I saw, um, anyway, I've read different just helpful guides about how to read one book a week and just kind of set that goal for yourself. That's a pretty good start, but do a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, and just deepen yourself and become, become an interesting person. <laughs> Deepen yourself and have a lot of interests. Do lots of things. Uh, two more. Life is complicated. And you need wisdom. And a sub points underneath these two things that I wrote down here. Uh, resist reductionistic formulas. Meaning, um, well, okay, this will combine some of what I said, like the trendy thing earlier. One of, one of the things that I hear a lot in an American context is follow your dreams find out what your passions are and pursue them. Uh, if you are, 
if you are passionate about the things that matter to you, the other details will work out eventually. Just follow your passions and do what you love most and do a lot of it. Um, and uh, I, I can see what they're saying in a way, um, but I would say the other direction too, which is there's a lot of stuff that you have to do in life that's not part of our passion. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff I have to do that's not my favorite, and I just I just have to do it. So, I, yeah, there's a lot of things in life where you do it and you work at it and you don't enjoy it, but you keep on working at it, and eventually, after a while, you get good at it, and then you do start enjoying it. It's not always there right on the front end. Anyway, my point of that, whether that's a helpful suggestion to you or not, is just it's a reductionistic formula. It's really simple. Here's the answer to life. In history or historiography, they talk a lot about um, don't try to interpret all of history through one single lens. I think that's great. And I think that fits here too. You, you're not really going to be able to interpret all of life through a single lens. And if somebody offers that to you, if it's from scripture, okay, maybe, um, though maybe you need to dig a little deeper too. But in any case, if somebody offers you a single lens for all of life, at least you should have a little bit of skepticism. Uh, similar to that, a common piece of advice in a talk like this, things I wish someone had told me, um, you know, talking to older people and hearing what older people suggest, I do think there's great wisdom in that, in the sense that they've already lived life, it's, it's asymmetrical. They've lived 20s, 30s, 40s, and they've lived 60s, 70s. So they see more than I do. They see more than any of us do because they've been past it. So there is a reality there. I will just comment one other side to that, which is, you know, Proverbs will talk about the hoary head, the gray hair, the white hair um, is a crown of glory if there's wisdom found in it. And my point is, everybody gets old, but not everybody is wise. There are some foolish old people, just like there are foolish young people. So my advice here would be, that's great. Listen to people who have lived life and come past. Just make sure that they're wise people. You can get bad advice from, from people in their 80s. That happens, like, a lot. <laughs> there are, with all due respect, just humanity being the way it is, there are going to be fewer wise people, even if you sample a random group of 80 year olds, there are going to be far fewer wise people and far more foolish people in any age bracket. So what I'm actually asking myself is not just, okay, uh, this person's older, therefore they're wise. What I'm asking is, wait, how did their life lived out? How was their life lived out? Do I actually see the results of wisdom coming through in their life or not? And that's now what I'm evaluating and going to interact with. Uh, I got some good questions here in the chat, so let me engage with some of those for a second. Uh, someone comment here, please suggest 20 titles to read in 2021. Well, I can't give you 20, um, but I can give you a couple that I really, that I read recently and really liked. Uh, here's one, I'm dropping it in the chat. It's called Atomic Habits. Um, that was a very transformative book for me this year. All he's doing in that book is he's analyzing some of the structure of how, how we tend to live our lives. And he's recognizing that maybe our habits are more important than a lot of the things that we think. So, you know, we just kind of fall into a habit where we just do this because that's what we always do and we stop even realizing what we're doing. Um, so it's a really good book because it, he calls you to, he basically gives you a practical guide on how to change your habits, how to adjust what you do and how to pay attention to your habits. It's a really good book. I, I like that. That maybe is my favorite productivity book. Um, I found that very profitable. There was another book like that that was so good that I forget what it was called. So I'm just scrolling down. Um, and it was, it was related to Atomic Habits, and it stuck in my, oh, I know what it is, Deep Work. Yes, that's right. He has a, he has a weekly newsletter that's very good. 
I like that book a lot. Uh, and then the newsletter and lots of, he has a lot of uh, internet content. Deep Work is another book like this that was transformative for me for um, specifically for getting things done. And I, I enjoyed that book. And then the other book I'm gonna tell you about later, but since you asked me about it now, I'll, I'm trying to get the author's name spelled correctly. Uh, here it is, Happiness, a Very Short Introduction by Daniel Habern. I just read this two weeks ago, and I'll come back to it. I'll talk about it in a little bit, but I really liked that book. Uh, that was a very helpful book. He's an unbeliever. All of these books I've given you are written by unbelievers, um, but they're, it was a helpful, it was just a good, it was, it, it was thought-provoking. Even though I don't agree with everything he said, I'll talk about it in a bit. So, um, all right, I might stop there. There are some others here, though, that I just don't think they're going to be, I don't think they're going to be universally interesting. <laughs> they were interesting to me because maybe they touched on, like, a field that I'm interested in. Um, but I'll keep on thinking, and maybe some of these others will come. I, you know, I, I like to read a lot of C.S. Lewis. So if you want to pick up some C.S. Lewis, I don't think you're ever going to be disappointed there. I read Tolkien all the way through this year. Um, so the Lord of the Rings series. Um, and that was a lot of fun. So anyway, there's things like that. Um, good question here on life scripts. Uh, how should we react when we're told what we need to achieve or get by in life? And, you know, viewing academic achievements as important step, important stepping stones to a successful life in general. I mean, I'm with you. I'm, I'm a teacher. <laughs> and I clearly believe highly in academic pursuit um, just because that's what I did. And it changed my life. So, I mean, education is, investing in yourself is a really, really good idea. Um, I don't know what to say. Beyond that, I don't know that I'm going to just be able to give any kind of simple or helpful answer for like how much you follow a life script versus how you go off script. There are reasons that a lot of people do a certain thing. And I'm not, none of this is an argument to say just be different to be different because I don't think that's going to help anybody. There is a reason that we do education in our youth <laughs> because then you can use it for the rest of your life. I mean, it's it's sensible. I think my idea probably on the life scripts is not so much make sure you like don't follow the pattern everyone else follows. That's not my argument as much as don't assume the values that they assume. Pursue education, great. Pursue it because you love God and his kingdom. I mean I did. I spent the first I was think I was 30 when I graduated finally. Um, so I, I made those investments and I, I'm glad I did. I really am. But um, I just make sure you pursue for the sake of lasting values. I really don't want you to hit like, or your kids or whoever, relationships. I don't want you to hit your 30s and wake up and go, and so I worked for all these years, and what is it so that I can make money? That's the thing that I find depressing. So to have a sense of what it is exactly you're pursuing and why, why you're going after that. Um, Good question here also from Jonathan, why we can, we take a long-term view of current trends, but in building relationships, uh, sometimes we need to know about current things. How do we strike a balance? So I'm with you and I don't have any simple answers on that. For myself, maybe you're different. I don't do a lot with sports and I'm glad for you. If you're interested in sports, that's fine. Something about sports feels to me particularly fading as in you know, the next year it just starts all, all over again. That's just me. Um, a similar thing for me here. Uh, there was something else and it went out of my mind. I, oh, I don't spend a ton of time with movies and TV. Just to try to keep up with the favorite shows that everybody's into. One thing, a lot of them are defiling. And then, especially now, gracious, like Netflix series will come out. It'll be like, it'll be like 60 hours, one series. 60 hours of my life. I'm never getting that back. And I'm going to learn a lot more by reading than watching. It's just fact. So some of those things are so time consuming. I don't know that the payoff is worth it. I still can connect with people pretty well on, you know, if I keep up with the basics, I, I keep up, I try to keep up with politics. I try to keep up with some 
some other trends and things like that. But I'll, I think I'd like to argue that the enduring human questions are things that you can bring up with anybody. I'll talk about some of those in a little bit. So some of these enduring questions, you don't have to be into the, the latest trend in order to have a conversation going that direction. Okay, my last concept is a, um, is a rabbit hole. My last concept is a, a concept that just takes me out into a bunch of stuff. So let me go there. And this was, this was the idea, just two words, live well. <laughs> Which is it's <laughs> um, live well is just an absurdly simple and absurdly reductionistic guideline. <laughs> live well. Well, what do you mean by living well? Okay, so you didn't tell me anything. Everybody wants to live well, um, and everybody thinks they are living well. So did you say anything at all? No, I didn't say anything. Everybody thinks that they're living well. I guess my my argument or my suggestion or my plea here is take the time and trouble to figure out what your goals actually are and why you value those things. Don't just let life happen. So I'm back to my thing that I mentioned a little while ago. I said I was listening to this podcast. Um, I'll drop in the chat. It's Econ Talk with Russ Roberts. Uh, he's an economist at uh, George Mason University. It's a, it's a, oops, I got the wrong button. Um, it's a very good podcast. I've listened to it or followed it in some way for years. I can't listen to all of them. I don't have time. They're long. But I think once a week he drops in something. Very intelligent interviewer. Um, very intelligent. And he's an economist. He talks, of course, naturally about a lot of economics discussions. But he also just talks to authors. He's, he's an interesting person, so he reads. And... Um, he in this come in this interview he's talking with the guy that I, I pasted in earlier here Daniel Habron happiness a very short introduction it's part of this Oxford very short introduction series that's Oxford isn't it um, where they will take these different topics and they just give you like a hundred pages on a topic and they're nice they're nice little books because you can get through them so quickly cover something yes it is Oxford you can get through them really quickly and like learn about a new area that you'd never heard of before. So I like these little books. They're fun. They have them on everything. I read one on logic. They had one on, they have, you know, like Buddhism, Islam, uh, Freud, you know, Stalin, any, whatever topic almost, not really, but lots of, you know, Russian history. And you can read this 100 page quick blow through guide and just educate yourself on something. They're fun. So anyway, this, this book is written by a philosopher um, he's not a believer. He's an atheist, or at least he says so in the interview. But the discussion is what is happiness? What does it mean? And how does it work? It just even how do you how do you think about happiness? And I put this in the document that I sent to you. There's a bunch of thoughts in there, and they're kind of disorganized thoughts. So you can sort that out and spit out whatever isn't helpful to you. But in that document, here, I can, I can share this on the, no, it'll be distraction, distracting. But there were a couple of things I, I commented in there. Um, he just observed that many, quote, highly successful individuals, the leaders in their fields, in order to succeed on that level and to be like the best in your field, you probably had to sacrifice a lot of the things that make life most meaningful. And you can find a lot of examples of this. Um, Marissa Meyer is eponymous for, she's, she was the CEO of Yahoo. Before that, she worked at Google. And she's highly accomplished, but she's eponymous for absurd work hours. As in, she has talked about working consistently 130 hour work weeks. Okay, for reference, um, a, a work week only has, I mean a week, any week, only has 168 hours in it. So if you work 130 hours of that, that means five and a half days every day belong to you, including sleep. But let's say that she spends half an hour, I don't know, like taking a shower, brushing her teeth, uh, using the bathroom and eating. You're sleeping five hours a day, every day. Is that a life or are you a slave? 
and and I'm not saying that's the only way to get to the top of your field, but a lot of the people who are eponymous for their fields, that's how they got there. And um, Hebron just comments, he says, you know, we might admire the likes of Vincent van Gogh or Wittgenstein, a famous philosopher. We, we might admire the likes of these people for what they accomplished, but I don't know that you want their life. That's really true. And I don't know that their life was lived out in a balanced way. I'm glad that somebody else did that because I like Van Gogh. I'm glad for his work, but I'm glad also not to be him. <laughs> Another insight from Hebron that I that was Hebron that was helpful for me. Um, they do a lot of, and I, I've seen this in multiple studies. You can just you Google it a little bit, you'll find it. But if they study the correlation, you know the correlation causation distinction. If they follow the correlation between money and happiness, and it's granted it's reported happiness, but they try to do other measures too, things like you know stress. Um, there are ways to measure stress, and even you can correlate like with things like divorce and things like. I mean, there's all kinds of correlates you can make, income levels and things like that. Anyway, if you measure across these and you you do your best to come up with a a metric on happiness, and you correlate that with income. It is true that more money brings happiness to a point. To a point because if you're living in like abject poverty and you're having trouble feeding your children, then by definition, your lack of money is dominating your life. So you're not happy in the sense that you're really frustrated. <laughs> you would be because you just can't meet your basic needs. Once you can get past that basic needs level, and for a lot uh, that a lot of measures in industrialized countries, that comes around uh, usually around fifty thousand household income, which is actually like right around middle class average ish, fifty thousand per year, <laughs> fifty thousand per year household income, both both incomes together. Past that point more money doesn't really make much of a difference. And you can measure all the way from middle class up to like mega millionaires, billionaires, to the very top, top, top of the income brackets. And by what, as best we can do measuring it, it doesn't seem like it helps much. So you don't wanna be in a place of poverty where you just can't do anything, you can't even care for your family. But there is a point where putting in more work and more accomplishment and getting further in the career, it's a really vanishing payoff. You're trading pieces of your life. You're trading life and time and relationship because you're putting stress on family. You're trading pieces of your life for more money and, and it's not even helping you. And there's kind of that um, paradigm that, that, well, anyway, I don't know the stereotypical guy who works 80 hours or 100 hours a week and so he has a boat and he has a big house and he has a huge big screen TV and he has a pool in the backyard and he's never there because he's always at work trying to pay all the bills to pay off the debt for acquiring all of these things that he never has time to use. And it's really depressing. <laughs> if you're looking another Hebron insight just drawing out from this book the things that struck me if you're looking for a correlate um, something that you can correlate or you can match up with happiness one of the best correlates that you can find apart from spiritual things would be uh, relationships strong relationships if your relationships are broken you're 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 probably not going to be a happy person and strong relationships are a huge part of this. Another huge correlate that Hebron gives is having a meaningful, purposeful center of your life. Um, he's gonna connect this win with some Aristotelian philosophy, which is an idea that you fulfill what you were made to do. So some kind of sense of I was made for a purpose, I was made to do something. And so living that out and doing that and flourishing in that. There is a joy in doing what you were made to do. So finding some kind of purpose, and that's 
fits into his argument, his ideas here. Again, I, this is I'm pulling this from a, a philosopher who doesn't believe in God at all. But he observe, observes this to just to recognize. So as humans, we kind of have benchmarks by which we try to measure our value. I'm doing well because this. I got the promotion or my income is above the rest of the income bracket or I'm doing better than my peers. We have some kind of benchmarks that we measure ourselves by. And his argument goes, those things aren't actually making you happy. Do you have a core purpose, like something you live and believe in that's bigger than yourself? Something that transcends just, I got money. Something that transcends you. Not just trying to accumulate accomplishments and resources for yourself, but really trying to stretch out and help other people, something meaningful and purposeful. Um, and finding a way to do what you were made to do in that kind of transcendent, meaningful way. That takes me out to, if you have the notes, the next block in that section, I just said an abductive case for God. Um, abductive is maybe not a word you use a lot, but abductive is, it's a, it's a philosophical term for uh, what is the concept that most explains the information? In other words, so here's the data points, you know, A, B, C, X, Y, Z. Here's the data points. Is there an explanation for those data points? You need something that explains the information. And I'm kind of going to do that here a little bit. My argument here would go, in terms of this idea, people tend to be, they, they tend to need something that transcends themselves. I want to argue in a materialistic or non-theistic universe, I mean, what can you live for that extends beyond yourself? You, you can say things like, I want to help humanity out, or I want to make the world a better place. And I mean, it's okay, I guess. But I think my, my argument here goes, I, I'm going to take the reality of God as the foundation for what anyone could pursue as true meaning. I, I don't know that you're going to find a more rich concept for meaningful living or human flourishing than the God who made us. And if I'm taking this kind of Aristotelian idea that we are going to do best when we are living out what we were made to do, I mean, there is in that, listen to it, something that we were made to do. There's something purposeful, intentional. The philosophical term would be teleological. There's an intention, purpose, reason for existence built into that. Our modern world is a little depressing for turning us into economic units. And so I just, I just work and I grind out value. Okay. And I'm going to argue theologically, you were made for more than that. You were made for a bigger, much, much bigger purpose than that. You are not just an economic machine. You are not just a cash cow. You're not just there to generate value. What is that purpose? Well, a purpose requires a purpose giver. And I do think that purpose is personalized and individuated. I think he's got a purpose for me and for you. And each one of us fits into that purpose. And I can slide that into categories like what I'll talk about later on tonight. Each one of us has specific spiritual gifts. The church needs you with your gifts and your abilities. You. You are a puzzle piece that fits. You belong. And the church needs you with those gifts. And I think that gives us a sense of meaning that is... Um, it's deep. It's far deeper than any other, any other way I can find to talk about meaning. Okay, let me pause for a second. I think my tea is cold, but I'll still drink it. Tea is good, whether warm or cold. It's just, it's just good. Great, nice question. Um, yeah, Jordan Peterson, very interesting. Uh, that could be an interesting read to add to my list of things. I read that, I can't remember if it was last year or this year. It might have been last year. It's an interesting book. Uh, the, what is it, 10 Rules Ten rules for Life? Um, and I enjoyed the book a lot. You, you know a little bit about his, uh, his story here. It's, it's very fascinating, but depressing. 
Um, yeah, I mean, he got into some mess here, I think, with some just some different uh, pharmaceuticals he was on, and he almost died. Uh, so there was a, finally he put up a video, I don't know, maybe six months ago, and you could just see that he was not doing well. And then I think since then he's he's pulled himself out, and I think he's doing better. Um, anyway, I mean, the, the thing about that book is, or just his philosophy in general, there's things when I was reading and I would think, whoa, this guy has a brilliant insight. I don't hear anybody else in our progressive contemporary world that's willing to say things like this. I mean, he would say stuff and thank you, thank you, thank you. Nobody says that, thank you. <laughs> so um, there were things like that. And I really did think as I read him, he was, he was giving some wisdom that would help people think about life much better. And I have heard of even, I mean, like relationships, people I know or have met personally, that their lives were changed. The thing is just, it's like any philosophy disconnected from scripture, it's a mixed bag. And so like I would read it within one chapter, I would turn, you know, three pages and I would be saying, I can't believe somebody says this still, but this is wise. And I turn the next page and I'd be like, what? Horrifying. Um, you know, he has this extended, I think it's like chapter two or something, but he has this extend, whole extended philosophy that he draws out from lobsters um, and how they basically, uh, natural selection within the biology and the community of lobsters and how the bigger lobsters <laughs> kill the smaller lobsters and that kind of thing and it was it's kind of like a jack london red and tooth and claw sort of thing like this is the way that the universe works you just gotta try to get to the top and i i found that really depressing i mean he made some other points in it but you know you read that section and oh no but then you'll go to the next section and there'll there'll be some wisdom in there and i to me some of the um I guess some of the litmus tests for me that was so fascinating but depressing about it was even with some of the life wisdom he had that was mixed in there with all these other things, um, I, I kind of think the story of this last two years, anyway, I don't know. It's sad. I'm, I'm sad for him as a person, as a person made in the image of God. I'm sad for people that followed him in that sense. I do hope that he can get his life back together and some of the content he had was helpful. I, I, anyway, my only caution, I'll stop going with that, but my only caution would be, you definitely don't want to just hit yourself to it. Like Jordan Peterson, wise. I, I wouldn't put just wise. I would say he had, he had or has had some wisdom, but it's mixed. <laughs> and I, yeah, so that, it's a very interesting book. If if you're if you're if your theolo theology is strong and and ready, then um, I mean I enjoyed the book. It's just maybe a little complicated because it's mixed. It's mixed up with some things that are off. Great question. Anyone else? Um, there's a bunch of a bunch of other things in the notes that I I won't and I can't talk about because time. Uh, but. There are some concepts that I had in there from Ecclesiastes. So I guess the only other thing I'm going to drop in here, I want to talk about Ecclesiastes and then I'll, I'll give you a comment to take us out or finish up here. But unless you want to, unless you want to, I'm happy to keep on discussing things together and glad to keep on going here with things. But um, the Ecclesiastes, con or Ecclesiastes concepts, I love Ecclesiastes and it has been just utterly transformative for me. I can't overstate the richness of Ecclesiastes for my own life. So anyway, if you would consider thinking about taking some time to really go in deep with Ecclesiastes, you're not going to regret it. Uh, Ecclesiastes is an extraordinarily rich book. And I will, if you give me a second, I will try to pull it up here for you. I have an extended study guide on Ecclesiastes. I spent about a year just digging in deep. Um, we, we did Ecclesiastes at JSM, and uh, I enjoyed very much working through it with everyone. 
But uh, if you're interested in that study guide, if maybe you weren't around at that point or something, I'll give that to you just a second. Um, all right, here it is. And this is just chapter by chapter going through the whole book. Uh, you're going to see in here, it's from a class. So you'll see like a, uh, a schedule. But then you're also going to see after that, you'll see the study guides and then an extended like verse by verse explanation. And it, Ecclesiastes is very, very life defining. So I hope you'll think about it. Was there a comment there? Somebody, I heard some noise. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, uh, so, go ahead. <laughs> accident, it was an accident. I'm losing it here. All right, so I've got in there two things, two documents you can download. One is study guides chapter by chapter, and then the other is like an exposition. Um, and between those two, you've got a lot of content about Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is the biblical book that talks about some of this. What does life mean? So I'll uh, talk about that for just a little bit if I was going to go into Ecclesiastes. Um, the notion of Ecclesiastes is that enjoyment matters. We're not against enjoyment. Christianity calls you to enjoy life. The argument of Ecclesiastes is that there is no better way to live and enjoy life than God's way of living life. That is the best way to live life. But then where that's going to end out as you flow through the book is you get to the end, chapter 12, and um, it, it brings together all of the pieces and it brings together all of the questions into one with this foundation just starting out. And I'll, I'll share it here so we're all looking at the same thing. But remember now thy creators in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. The section that follows is old age. And so the idea here is to say, remember God before you get down to things kind of grinding down for you. <laughs> um, and why remember God? I'll just back up a little bit here in the context with frameworks like this. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee, walk in the ways of thy heart. Know that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. And if I fast forward down to the end, the end of the book, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. This right here, this phrase is a notoriously difficult phrase to translate. And so I, I, one way to translate it that works is to say, um, this is the whole person. Or what it means is this is the complete, well-rounded person. Like this, this is the successful life. So I said earlier, resist reductionistic formulas. If you were gonna come up with a reductionistic, like, you know, six word formula that would actually, I guess it's seven, that would actually be able to successfully represent good living, wise living, you won't do better than this. Fear God and keep his commandments. And what's rich about it is, look at the words for a second. It is both um, ethical in the sense of, uh, what do you say? Here are principles or here are things to do, right and wrong. It's also attitudinal. It is both abstract and personal. It's a relationship with him. And it gets into the heart and the attitude, even as it governs the actions. So it's not either just like, okay, as long as you feel the right things and love the right things, it'll work out. No, I mean, there are practical things you must not do. Nor is it, will just follow the rules. Who cares if you love him or not? It's, it's both. And those things together define full, well-orbed, balanced humanness, what human beings ought to be. But something I don't think I've appreciated enough until recently was this, uh, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The concept of judgment, my tendency in the past was to read judgment, like that phrase, to read that strictly negative, 
Okay, judgment is coming. Um, but I would like to understand it broader, which is, it's the, the principle I talked about earlier today, and I'll just return to it now. If I had to give a single concept that has helped me, I guess helped me put aside the temptation to live life trying to please people or trying to accumulate accomplishments. I've, I've struggled with that a lot, especially, it's confessions, especially within this, this decade of my life. Uh, the last 10 years of my life particularly, okay, well, what am I trying to accomplish? Am I, what do I want and what am I trying to pursue? And it's so tempting to see what your friends or your classmates were doing, you know, the people of your same group and oh no, he's accomplished this great thing and I haven't. And you know, you can do that kind of stuff. And just a concept that has been so transformative and helpful to me was to get back and remember, wait, wait, fundamentally, my life will be defined as successful if God is pleased. So that there is this human tendency to weigh ourselves out in the balances. Well, how am I doing in the stack? comparing myself against other people and they're my metric so my metric against how they did and i measure my relative success against that but to come back and remember god is the judge god is the definer god is the yardstick god measures his approval of my life is the measure of how i'm doing and so what am i doing on thursday december 17th my goal today is to please him I, I want to finish December 17th, 2020, and I want the Lord to look at what I did and say, that was worth doing. <laughs> that defines success. That defines meaning. And that's exactly what Ecclesiastes is saying. The concept of judgment there is God is the evaluator of how my life went. Therefore, if I want to be a full person, a successful person, then this will be defined this way. Do I fear him? And do I do what he told me to do? Because he defines and he evaluates how I did. So I'll leave you with that. I'm happy to, I'm happy to be here and chat further. I liked these questions that uh, you all have asked some very, very good thought provoking questions. So I'd be glad to interact further. And then there's other things in the notes just we weren't able to talk about, but if you want to take a look at those. This Hebron book that I've mentioned a couple of times, it's a great read. I think it's like $9 US on Kindle. As I've said, I don't agree with it all. I would like to write on it, actually. I'd like to gather some of the thoughts and try to put it through a biblical lens. Um, I don't know. But uh, it's, a, it's a good, it got my thinking going. <laughs> got me thinking about some of these categories so um i'm thinking here about ate femi's or excuse me um sister femi's questions earlier ate is the way we do it in tagalog uh i was just gonna say any by david mccalla is a delightful is a delightful read and um who's the other one the i've read maybe more than half of this stuff. It's the, the guy who did uh, Steve Jobs, the, Steve, the, the most recent big Steve Jobs biography. I'm looking, Isaacson, Walter Isaacson. Anyway, I really like uh, David McCullough and Walter Isaacson if you're looking for like enjoyable history. Um, who's the guy who did uh, Malcolm Gladwell? Those are always fun. Um, I, I've not read his stuff as recently but for a while I was reading all of those those are fun if you're looking for some uh, some good theology that's going to stretch your mind something that a theologian that's really I guess popular right now but in a good way uh, Herman Bavink and I just read a, a book by him Christian Worldview um, and that was enjoyable so if you if you're interested in that he's going to stretch you uh, Christian Worldview was the one I read. The Wonderful Works of God is another one that came out recently, and then he has his full systematic theology, which I'm planning to read next year. So anyway, I mean, those are just some things that occur to me off the top of my head. If you're interested in a specific topic, ask about it. I may know something or I may not. There's a great website called Five Best Books, 
Um, and what they do here, fivebooks.com, what they do is they go through and they ask uh, different experts of what their view would be, like what their favorite book on XYZ would be. And uh, so if you're interested in like, okay, what's the best thing on Churchill? Then there's probably an article in there and they'll talk about the best books on Churchill. Um, and it'll be like a Churchill expert, which uh, I, I came to the conclusion, I picked out a Churchill bio if you're interested in it. It's the Andrew Roberts. It's maybe the more, most, it's the most recent Churchill bi biography that is uh, also what, it's a very good, there, there's a, a gazillion Churchill bios, but the most recent one that's also well acclaimed. And um, I'm most of the way done with it. It's fun. Ron Chernow is another good historian. And I'll, I'm putting the different uh, historian names in here of different people that I've, I've read and enjoy. All of these guys are like Pulitzer Prize or New York Times bestsellers or just very well acclaimed authors. So pretty much anything you pick up from them, you're going to probably enjoy. Anyone else? I can let us go. I'm. I mean, I'm more than happy to um, talk further. But I can let us go. There's no reason for us. I know it's it's a long. It's been a big week. So I'm glad for us to get the chance to rest and take a nap this afternoon. That's a good expression of Ecclesiastes. Go enjoy life and rest. <laughs> so if there's further interaction, I'm happy to interact. Or otherwise, I'll just um, I'll close this in prayer and. And of course, I'd always love to hear from you if you have questions later on and you want to talk about something else. So, okay, shall we pray? Um, hi. I think just I'll, just, <laughs> I'll, I'll just I'll uh, just say it here instead of type it out. Um, is there a way that we could be more self-disciplined in spiritual matters? Like, uh, I mean, besides some external gadgets or some other things to keep us on track, is there something else that we can do? Yeah. I mean, here's just what's coming to my mind. And um, I'm wanting to, actually, I've written about this. I've just not posted it yet. But I've, I'll plan to share it in the next, I don't know, couple of weeks. But I mean, the biggest thing that has come to my mind, and this is directly from that um, Atomic Habits book I mentioned earlier. But, you know, he talks about, again, unbeliever, but he's just talking about how do you change your habits. On some level with sanctification and these disciplines, that is what we're talking about. You're just trying to change your habits. You, it's like it's like losing weight. You know, everybody wants to lose weight and be more physically fit. But how do I get there? And um, so one of the things he talks about is the power of doing something daily, every, every, every day. So anyway, I mean, here's a, this is an app I've used, and um, there are a handful of different things in here. I mean, these are just my, my daily tasks. Um, and there are certain things that I, every day, I try to do these. You can see some of these. I've missed the, the number where it says, like, under, under this one, memorize, it says three. That's because I missed it three days ago. So it's not that I'm perfect on, you know, I've, I've missed days and things like that with these. But there's certain things I'm going for. And so I just decided back in April when the quarantine hit, what do I want my life to be every day, no matter what? Like the basic, I've got to have it. And I I make this kind of the center, um, pushing myself. And it, that this has transformed my life. This has helped me. It's just a practical thing. Um, and so each day I want to read for at least 30 minutes. I want to write for 30 minutes. Uh, a daily overview I do, organizing, cleaning things up, investing in learning a new skill, working out. 
uh, memorizing. That's for memorizing. I'm trying to memorize First John and pray at least 15 minutes a day, drawing, limiting my like social media browsing, go to bed by 1030, pray with my wife every night. So anyway, this is called Streaks. It's an iOS thing. Um, and uh, I'll even try to give you, give me a second here, and I'll try to give you the exact uh, link for it so you could just download it directly. Anyway, I like that app. It's a handy app. But I'm, I'm not saying that's for everyone, but it helped me. And that's also directly coming from this Atomic Habits book. And the, So those are some ideas. In terms of sanctification in general, I don't think you'll do better than um, Jim Berg, Changed Into His Image. That's an excellent book. If you've not read, read that, read it. That is an excellent book. You, you really should read that. Um, so, so those are some of the things that occurred to me. I can drop in here. I have a chapter in my Bible Doctrines notes talking about sanctification, just kind of giving an overall philosophy for sanctification. So anyway, those are some of the things. I'm just telling you things that have helped me because uh, we're all struggling with this. So it's a great question. Actually, what my concern is that would you not feel that after some, some while you feel like you're kind of like giving up or losing motivation? Right. I think, I think my answer there is, I suspect that the, um, yeah, like kind of pushing back against just burnout or something. And uh, there's an insight that pops into my mind here. This is from the Walter Isaacson, Steve Jobs biography. And Steve Jobs says, which Steve Jobs was not necessarily a wise man. Uh, but he just said, if I hit a point where I wake up in the morning and I'm frustrated, I burn. Maybe you wait a while. I think Dr. Joel's uh, connection might be a bit uh, not stable at the moment. Yeah. Burnout. I heard that. Yeah, so everyone just hold on a while. I think Dr. Joe is trying to reconnect. Maybe can I make a comment since I was waiting for uh, Dr. Arno? Yep, sure, bro. Yeah. Yes, please. Sure. Well, answering to your question, uh, uh, Joyce, actually, uh, this uh, mm -hmm. it was it was addressed by a, a similar question, a similar type, you know, addressed by Stephen Colby. So, uh, uh, first thing first, and, and many people uh, were unsuccessful in achieving their first thing first. So, what Stephen Colby said was this, like, it's actually most of us uh, don't really genuinely believe in our, in what we think is our first thing. Not being, not being honest with ourselves. Whatever that we say is our first thing, whatever say we said was our priority, it's not necessarily what we uh, write at the bottom, really our priority. Anyway, Dr. Anna is back. So, okay. Uh, Dr. Anna, I was just uh, telling them about what I read from uh, Stephen Covey's book. It's great. It's good. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, right before I cut out, I was just going to 
toss in one other idea and it was um you know if i hit a place where i really was just burned out could i recommend try to try to pull back try to pull back from the different other things you're doing and then um i kind of would recommend maybe launch a binge bible reading like i'm going to read through the whole bible in a month and just try that just really like hit yourself hard with a ton of bible for my personal life experience i burn out if i'm if i'm giving 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 and i'm not taking in so i've got to pay attention to the fountain i've got to pay attention to the source so i think that that is a big deal for me is pay attention to the source taking in lots of bible time to pray and maybe just time to get out you know what right now this quarantine uh depression levels are high um and some of that is anyway some of that is connected to everything that's going on a lot of people are struggling so anyway that has implications for us as believers too um and I, so i've got to pay attention not just to giving 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 but also filling my heart so those are some recommendations that occur to me if if, if when i hit a place that i'm really really just burning out I might try to step away from other things and just go deep reading and just filling my heart full of a lot of scripture. So I don't know if that helps. I dropped some things in the chat that relate to that. Uh, Dr. Anna, I have a comment. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, uh, I just want to know this particular verse, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29 to verse 30, right? So um, it says the time is short, right? So, uh, and uh, of course it talks about uh, people who are married, not married, but basically, you know, uh, the philosophy here is a bit defeatist, uh, defeatist of philosophy. Uh, but sometimes I use this, my friends, you know, I talk to others. So like, hey, you know, I'm 40 years old and I still haven't achieved this or haven't had a career or have not married yet. Doesn't matter. What does it matter? The Lord is coming, right? But if you have a wife, what's the big deal? The Lord is coming. <laughs> you don't have a wife? Nothing, you lost nothing because the Lord is coming. Right? Time is short. I think that's basically what it's saying. Is that it? Yeah, I mean, it was on my end of cutting out in and out just a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, like I, my reading of the passage is that he's saying Jesus is coming back soon. So this is, you know, don't think, okay, well, I've it's something like don't think well in order to have lived a full life i have to get married or i have to have this or that thing um in fact to fit your reading of it what i think you were just saying watch the following context here um he's going to say you know the time is short that's one expression and then down here uh the translation will do with verse 31 and uh, here the present form of this world is passing away so anyway the world is going away quickly that's kind of a first John 2 17 idea isn't it you know the world is passing away along with its desires it's all falling apart um, so I think your reading is fair enough don't it's it's like a concept like don't place all your trust in this world definitely don't be living for this world not even to the extent of marriage um so it would help single people for instance to say to them please don't think if only i get married then everything will come together for me <laughs> don't think that you know you're going to be the same person yeah, the PTs, uh, yeah, the PTs attitude, you know it's like yeah, yeah right that's a big deal <laughs> big deal you know? then uh, you'll never achieve anything in life if you have this kind of attitude right? you never have anything Right. right right no i think your reading is good in that yeah right 
absolutely don't live for this world. It's fading away anyway, even to the point of marriage. That's good. There was a chat question. It was a direct message to me. If I may, because the name is taken off of it, I'll just paste it in here so that we can all read it. But from Timothy and Titus, how do we balance our own reason slash wishes? I, I think we're talking about like the epistles, first, second Timothy, Titus. How do we balance our own reasons and wishes to submitting our life to God? Or is there a need for such a balance? <sighs> and that's interesting. I mean, I don't know exactly how to... Uh, I guess maybe my answer for that, to put those pieces together, I'm going to guess something like, start with scripture transforming your values. So, you know, like the Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 concept, that you begin by... Um, trusting in the Lord with all your heart and even letting him transform your heart. So sometimes the reason that somebody here, you know, be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, turn away from evil. He will make straight your paths. This kind of concept. I think the idea of it goes before you follow your desires, adjust your desires. <laughs> Is really you could want something that's not good. And so you've got to you've got to be so desperate to dig into the word that it transforms everything, including even the desires. So there's another question like this that was um, not for pasted in for everyone. And the question is, how do you respond to people who judge you for not achieving achieving the life script? And uh, they think this is typical of Christians. So I don't know what to say there, except really a healthy dose of um, a really a healthy dose of not letting yourself be controlled by the fear of man by saying you know don't be controlled by the fear of man I don't just mean don't care what anybody thinks I do care what people think I care what wise people think so I have people in my life that I respect that have walked with God and if they say to me hey you're getting off in this area I listen but there's other people that are going to scream at me, hey, you're being too, I don't know, too being too religious or something. And I think we have to have a healthy dose of not really caring what foolish people think. <laughs> so anyway, evaluate yourself by what God thinks and evaluate yourself by what wise people are talking to you about. And then from there, do your best to just really not, not care what the society overall tells you. The society overall will tell me what I, you know, just pursuing meaningful tasks is not as important as pursuing money. And I think that's wrong. <laughs> I just disagree. <laughs> I can, I think the society is all wrong. <laughs> um, they're gonna, they're just giving me the wrong lenses for judging life and I reject the whole thing. <laughs> so there's a good dose of that we have to have. Thank you for all of these. These are good questions and helpful for me. They make me think. Anyone else or if not, um, I will close us in prayer. But if you have another question, jump in there. I know sometimes you can feel embarrassed. Let's pray and then um, and then we can go from there but let's pray and, and we can finish out our time father thank you for the wisdom of your word and the richness of your truth and how it guides us and thank you I thank you for my brothers and sisters and for JSM and for um, the heart that's represented in the desire to follow you and your word thank you for the wisdom that is represented in the 40 people that are here and the wisdom of their lives how they have lived to walk with you thank you for teaching them and guiding them and how your truth has really shown itself in their choices and how they have prospered and i pray that you would help us each to prosper and be faithful help us to be abundant in our deep love for your word and flourish in it 
during this time right now, this quarantine, when there are just a lot of emotional and just a lot of stresses and pressures on people right now, I pray that you would give us grace and help us to find our foundation in you, to love you, to serve you as our most important priority. We beg your help in all of these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.